All right, so this is our update to the five minute tank. Uh, you get to see where these tanks are. We started them back in November. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, you should go back and watch, but uh, we were attempting to make a super easy startup guide. So like if yeah. you just want to consume all this information super fast, skip a lot of all the <laughs> explanations, just do it. Uh, this was designed to hit those people in that first year reefing and make it a lot easier. So this is what you're going to see today. Yeah. Uh, what you're going to see today is we're going to talk about the things that, uh, some things you didn't know, some things that worked, some things that didn't work and you could improve on, and just kind of wrap it up with our general thoughts and then we'll tell you where these tanks are actually going. If you're like me and you watch the 52 weeks of reefing, there's a ton of information in there, multiple hours, I think over like 24 hours of viewing. Uh, this one boiled down to five minute episodes. So what did we come up with? Like two hours, two and a half hours or so of binge watching. And we released it like binge watching too. Yeah. So at, at the trade shows, we always see uh, people over come up like at the Reef of Paloozas come down. And they're like, oh, I love the 52 weeks of reefing. Yeah. And so I watched all of it before I started reefing. And like part of me is like, oh, that's great. That's cool. Right? Yeah. I love it. The, you know, people love this stuff. <laughs> and the other part is like, oh man, poor you. Uh, you had to have watched like 50 hours of material <laughs> before you could ever get your tank up. There's right. got to be like an easier way. Right, than right, that, right. You know? And so that is where the uh, five minute reef guide came from. And actually there was a precursor to this. Yeah, uh, I didn't start with this one because I didn't get into the reefing hobby till about the, or a little before the 52 weeks of reefing, but you and Reed did a 40 breeder and then upgrade and all this other stuff too. I mean, this is basically the exact same thing, right? Like recognizing how hard this was to gather all the information. Like, hey man, what if we just like follow a tank in my basement? Yeah. So a lot of you watch 52 Weeks of Reefing, uh, but prior to that was the uh, How to Start Up a Saltwater Tank series right. with Reed and I, I think it was like 12 episodes or something with a 40 breeder in my basement. It was the <laughs> worst, worst, worst editing. The information I hopefully was there, but it was like, it was garbage editing. Editing not because Dave's fault, because Dave wasn't on board, but you did all the, most of the editing, right? Okay, so here's a little secret. Uh, <laughs> so I don't, I don't tell everybody this. I think this might be the first time anybody's ever heard this actually on camera. Oh. Yeah, so the way this would work is on Friday, Rhee would come over, right? And yeah. we'd shoot all of the A-roll, Rhee would go home, I would go grab a glass of vodka and I would just <laughs> sit there and edit like all night long because uh, uh, my girl at the time like worked nights. Yeah. Right? And so like I'd just sit there and have a cocktail and just door my, this is like an extension <laughs> of my hobby, right? Yeah. Uh, and it was, it was super fun because I wasn't good at editing and it was just like, ah, well, who cares, man? It's yeah. just fun and share the world uh, with everything. So that is why it looked terrible. All right, uh, but even more fun now, we elevate the whole thing oh, yeah. to today. Fast forward to the day where we get uh, an editor who knows what he's doing and doesn't work inebriated. And uh, then, but uh, I mean, you guys spent multiple days, uh, like five, six episodes a day and ended up with 30 episodes, 35 minute guides. So end of story, this time my goal was to eliminate all of the hardship of mm. starting up that first tank. So in this one, I really want to get past the need for 4,000 posts all over, you know, Facebook groups and forums and all, like every 50 books and like all conflicting information. Mm -hmm. Just get a super straight path. If I did this, I'd be successful. Yeah, right? direct advice on what equipment, what lighting, what fish, what corals, what rock, everything at five minute chunks at a time. So when I was pitching this to a friend of mine, he's like, there's no way you could possibly, you know, get everything anybody needs to know in five minutes. And I'm like, dude, it's not just five minutes because there's like 30 episodes here or something, like yeah. 26 or something like that. So it's two and a half hours. Like in two and a half hours, I think we can get everything you need to know about reefing packed in there. And I'm like, I'm confident we can do it. Right. So in the same time that normal people would watch like, uh, you know, Avengers or something, <laughs> right. right? You can get everything you want to know about reefing and be successful, mm -hmm. right? All right, so starting with the stuff you didn't know, <laughs> uh, how long did it take to get these tanks up? Uh, you've heard of movie magic. This happened here too. So we're talking like these tanks were insta-tanked uh, within like two, three days. Uh, they were actually up for inside of like just a couple of days, right? Yeah. And that was because Dave and I were shooting like super fast and furious, right? Uh, we were all the way like trying to get it in before Black Friday, you know, get all this kind of like uh, information into the universe. Great deals are coming, so like, <laughs> why not save on this stuff? Yeah. And you know what? Uh, there was like five or six episodes a day being shot. Poor Dave and I were like pulling out our hair. So that said, I was terrified every day. Like, I mean, the first day, first thing that happened every day, I came in here and like, 
let the tank be okay. Let the tank be okay. Yeah. Uh, right. And like we're just and like every day, man, like. This thing has come together exactly yeah. the way we want it. Totally insta tank the tanks mm. and uh, really never like it didn't, didn't skip a beat. Yeah, there's probably so there's probably a few reasons like why what led to that you could walk in every day and they'd be okay and then now we've been, been up for four months and they're still okay and we're gonna hit that in what worked. Yeah, we put a lot of thought into making sure that it was gonna work because it was a big deal. Yeah, uh, not necessarily the way I'd recommend it. Uh, in fact. Absolutely not the way I'd recommend it, <laughs> but just for the things that you didn't know, uh, man, we were jamming here, and through the magic of YouTube, uh, we were able to do it in just a couple of days, uh, but I'd definitely follow what's in there uh, yeah. and the actual path to do it for yourself. All right, so I'll let you start off with the first thing I think it worked. Uh, what worked is, I mean, look at these tanks. If I had this in my living room four months into my first you know, foray into the hobby, I would feel like I've won. Uh, I, I'm doing something right. Like the corals are okay. Uh, maybe lost a fish here and there. Maybe lost a coral here and there. But I'm seeing growth. I've got color. My tanks are full. They're vibrant. I, it's stuff that I can. All every single one of these corals I can uh, bring a friend over or share with my kids and be like, Hey, look, look at this one. This one's alive. It's thriving. This is really cool. And we just, uh, I'm winning. Yeah, okay. I, I would absolutely uh, agree. Yeah. Like, if I had set this tank up for my very first one, everybody came over and say, "Oh, that's super cool!" Mm -hmm. Right on. And uh, we did lose uh, like zoanthids in both of those things, and I'm not surprised because you, if you watch the series, you'll note that when we did the dip, we saw zoanthid nudies come off of mm -hmm. them. So, uh, you know, there's a whole series of things you need to do to like solve that, and yeah. uh, you know, like. They just wiped them out, right? Even even though the coarse rasses, you could watch them like eat mm -hmm. them off of there. It's still the last zoanthids. I haven't counted one for one the whole thing, but I'm pretty certain that those are the only uh, corals we actually lost. So I would call this a big win as well. For you know, this is your first tank. Follow this short little thing. You've had the mm. same type of success. So with that, we had these corals, speaking of the corals, we had them uh, donated to us. So Route 66 came through right in the beginning with the, I think you messaged them and said, you know, I want some large colonies. These things have to look like instant tanks right off the bat. Uh, and they sent us, you know, what you saw all through this series here. And uh, they have done very well. And then WWC came back behind them, added some more color, some more variation into there. Uh, now that the tanks were up and established and uh, doing just fine. So big thanks to both uh, Route 66 66 and WWC for filling up these tanks. So one of the other things that worked here, and I think you're going to see and agree with, is that the 40 breeder, you know, with the lower tech and the oh, cheaper yeah. gear, performed identically as the more expensive tank with the more expensive gear. So yeah. uh, you know, if you follow along, you get to see we kind of took two different paths there. Nearly identical results. In fact, you said. Uh, I would say, to me personally, this tank, the 40 Breeder, looks the be like the best between the two for me. And I mean, so inside the tank, if you're looking at inside the tank, uh, I give this one all of my thumbs up for what it looks like inside. And, and that kind of leads itself to the, 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 the dimensions of the 40 Breeder and why it's so popular of a first tank. I mean, you get the width of 36 inches, you get you know a nice front to back 18 inch depth. Uh, so it, it just naturally looks good just by the way that you can lay out the aquascape. Um, and if any, like I said, if any of this tank is familiar to anybody else, hang on the back of equipment. Uh, a lot of this stuff isn't uh, like hang on the back or doesn't have to be. So not as obtrusive as some people might think putting equipment inside your tank are, uh, but obviously successful. Yeah, so I don't think equipment, like really uh, the quality of the equipment changed the type of the results no. in either case, right? Uh, and I'll agree. I like the 40 breeder shape, you know, mm -hmm. and that's probably why I would agree that that tank, if I just looking inside of the tank, actually uh, turned out better. But yeah. either one of these things uh, turned out like a win. But you know, a lot of people, you know, talk about yeah, I need more gear, I need more gear. And in this case, I'm just gonna tell you that you know the mm -hmm. gear didn't play a real role. There's some things about ease of use and other elements that yeah. uh, play a role here, but not in terms of results. So in relation to that, uh, there's one big thing here between what a lot of people recommend for your tank that like you need. Yeah, but, uh, we just said you didn't. <laughs> I it? mean, there's a there's a correlation between these two tanks uh, in that they have no sump. There's the E170 all in one system, obviously doing well, uh, following uh, the method here. Uh, the 40 breeder with hang on or hang in equipment also doing just as well. No sump underneath. Yeah, so a sump you know, adds water volume, which is nice. It gives you a place to hide all the gear, which yeah. is absolutely nice. 
but adds all for your first tank adds all this complexity, man. I have to plumb it. I have to make sure that I'm not you know going to deal with like floods and overflows mm -hmm. and all mm -hmm. kinds of other stuff. It makes it a lot noisier. All kinds of different things. And so there are some advantages to it uh, that opens up a whole different you know realm of gear and stuff you can put in the tank as well. But you don't need it to be successful. No, I'd say like following. Uh, a good progression for a beginner, now that I've been through all of those phases. Uh, this is, I mean, if you can show results like this and not have all of that equipment, then just like any other hobby, if you're going to evolve in the hobby and you learn more about it and you get more interested into it, uh, then my next tank, I'm gonna try out a sub, just because I've kinda got some basics down and I know I can make a tank that works. Uh, why not expand a little bit, add a sump in, get, just feel out that complexity a little more. Yeah, so with the BRS WWC hybrid method, you can see the E170 that has all the SPS corals in it. It's so Again, tank. you do not need a sump to be successful. Mm -hmm. uh, end of story. Is there all kinds of advantages? Yes, right? The E170 is kind of nice because you can put a sump down there at a later date, it's mm -hmm. already pre-plumbed and whatnot, but you just don't need it. And so I think it's helpful for newer reefers to just know that. And actually, I think the E170 actually gives, or all the all-in-ones, like uh, the Innovative Marines too, mm -hmm. uh, allow kind of one of the biggest benefits, which is you get all of that gear off the back, or at yeah. least it's hidden. So, you know, part of it is just so the tank looks clean in your house, yeah. right? Uh, and this one, man, if you look in the tank, is super awesome. But it also has a bunch of stuff on the back, right? Uh, whereas this one just looks super clean on all angles. Yep. Uh, and so that's a lot of the value and why I think the all-in-ones, uh, you know, kind of look a lot nicer in your house. So another win, I think, on these tanks was actually using the real reef rock. Yeah, this was, if you go back to our 2019 uh, best of rock, uh, this was your vote. Uh, and this is the stuff you want. I mean, a uh, couple things. One. Uh, it comes wrapped in paper, partially wet, so there is like a bacteria already on it. But uh, in the cases of these, like you get this tank that looks like an Insta tank. I don't have bone white rock that I'm looking at and waiting for coralline algae to grow or to you know grow on it to turn it purple. It looks good right off the bat. But for a brand new tank, for somebody who just wants you know as little trouble going forward and fewest hurdles. This was a sweet thing. It looked nice from day one, yep. right? And even though, you know, it comes out of like uh, holding vats where they soak it forever. Mm -hmm. When I pulled it out, I could peel off the paper and I could visibly see algae on the rock itself. Oh yeah. Uh, but there was two reasons why I don't think we had algae, even though there was some algae on it. What's the first, what's the first one? Uh, for me, it's the utilitarian fish. So we specifically chose fish for a purpose and you know, Probably the one of the biggest ones, but since we're talking about algae, is the algae eating fish. So we've got, you know, voracious tangs like these yellow tangs and coal tangs and, you know, different types of uh, uh, tangs like that, that that focus on algae. And if you put them in the tank before algae even starts growing, yeah, you can get a, a, gra a grasp on it that it might be inevitable uh, in most tanks, but in here, like, we didn't really see the algae. Yeah, so like the most helpful advice I think you could give to any new reefer is select fish that are gonna eat algae for a living. Mm -hmm. You'll like, you know, tr transform their first year of reefing and increase the success rate so much by considering fish as part of the cleanup crew, mm. right? So when I started this hobby, everybody told me cleanup crew is a bunch of hermit crabs snails, and snails and yeah. stuff. And my experience is they do eat algae, but there's no way that a snail, you know, the way that they just kind of eat around is like clearing algae out of mm -hmm. my tank or the crabs are doing it. They are getting some, you know, for sure, but you can just look at the glass and see how little of the glass they actually get in the trail <laughs> they leave. So, you know, they, they do help, but you know what actually transforms it? Fish that are hunting that stuff down all day, mm -hmm. every day. They're like doing this for a living, keeping your tank clean. And I think that's a big part of it. The other part of it is uh, I followed uh, Jeff over at Vibrance, uh, you know, advice, and mm -hmm. you know he does a lot of tank maintenance, and actually that was his primary career prior to Vibrant, and actually where Vibrant came from. But you know he wanted to make sure that the uh, tanks, you know, basically found that the tanks where he visited every week looked awesome. Mm -hmm. The tanks that he visited every two weeks tended to be a little dirty by the time mm -hmm. he got back there, right? So he created the Vibrant product, and all of a sudden, they never have algae in them. They look pristine all the time. Hmm. And he starts it from the beginning. They yeah. look great from the beginning. Voila. 
right? So we started it on these tanks, and I'll tell you, between the two things, we never saw any LG. So we dosed the Vibrant from the beginning, and we never saw any LG. Total, total, total win. Well, in relation to the, you know, talking about the fish too, not just in algae, uh, but you know, like we like we mentioned earlier, like the we lost some zoanthids, we lost some corals, and again, we chose fish, you know, specifically to, to target pests and things like new. Uh, uh, Zoeidae nudibranchs or flatworms and things like that. And the chorus wrasse, we have footage of it actually picking at those nudibranchs, so doing its job. Uh, the footage actually was totally, I was just doing it live, talking about it, all of a sudden, bam, he's doing it, wow. <laughs> uh, and so I actually thought that he was gonna win in the same way that adding the six line wrasse wiped out all visible signs of the money mm -hmm. eating nudings of the 160. Yeah, I thought true. they were gonna win here, they didn't. Uh, but yeah, so really thinking about the whole way, and one of the things I was thinking is, in hindsight, I might have added uh, a file fish to both of these for Aptasia because Aptasia oh, yeah. is such a big deal for new reefers as well. Uh, so I might have done that in, in hindsight as well, uh, maybe next time. All right, so the next thing that absolutely worked on this, and this is something that people like, you know, put a lot of effort into and get wrong all the time. Yeah. What worked? Yeah, the, the lighting, obviously. So uh, we're looking at LPS and soft corals, lower light demand corals, perfect beginner corals, and you don't need to spend hundreds and hundreds and thousands of dollars on lighting these things. Uh, in the case of the E170, it's included in the system, so uh, and the one light does the trick. So uh, you know, built into that cost, you're, you, mean, you could just knock that off of the of building your own tank and putting piecing together your own equipment. But two of the little primes here, you know, a couple hundred bucks a piece, uh, more than enough to fill out and uh, pro provide ample light for this entire tank. One of the cool things about the primes, though, for me, is mm -hmm. that if you want to, like, you know, go to advanced corals or something, go beyond where we're at now. Yeah. You can just add a third just one. Add more, right? yeah. And like, so that works. So whether you're talking about this size tank or even bigger, so that's kind of the modularity of some of these mm -hmm. uh, form factors. But this is the part that I think worked the best, right? All right. So normally people just kind of leave you to your own devices and yeah. how to set up your lights and what to do. In this case, you know, we took out the par meter, you know, mapped out all of the tanks, and then like developed uh, all of the settings and then shared them directly with you. So. If you want to set up this exact tank, get our two primes, match the settings we did, and know you got it right. Yeah. Like, that is not the way that this has been going for a long, <laughs> long time. And so I know you're doing some videos recently with uh, the Radions mm -hmm. and other things, and actually the bigger brother to, to this one. Yep. And I think we're going to be doing that for probably months now, just like keep sharing lighting. So like we can get to that point where lighting is just never a problem for anybody. But right in the series, setting up either one of these tanks, set it to this, and just know you got it right. You don't need to rent a par meter, you don't need to do anything. You can just follow this advice and you know you're done. If you want to, mm -hmm. you know, you can confirm with the par meter because you got some really unique uh, size, you got a different size or shape tank, you deviated a little bit mm -hmm. from this, or uh, because you got a really wacky aquascape. But I think that both the lighting choices here, this one was matched to this tank perfectly, the two primes light up a 40 breeder perfectly, and then giving the information to use it. All right, another couple of things that worked out super well in these tanks is the Eheim Liberty filter, houses all the carbon. It was super easy to implement. Yeah. It's really cheap and it's a really easy way to implement carbon on a hang-on tank like this. Also though, the Comline DC uh, skimmer from Tunes. Uh, I think it's surprise. called the DOC skimmer. Yeah. You know, to be honest, man, like I knew these existed on the plant, but I've never actually used or no. touched one. It was a total mistake. This uh, this was a mistake in my own in my own uh, you know upbringing into the hobby. When I had a 40 breeder, I used a hang on the back type skimmer that actually hung off the side of the tank, thinking that you know this is you know this is less equipment inside my tank, so it's less gear that I have to look out uh, look at. But you know looking back at hindsight, uh, that was probably a point of failure that I added to my own tank that I didn't have to add. Because with, you know, water outside of the tank, coming in and out of the tank, I can, that just leads to the possibility of water on my floor. Then when you look at the Comline skimmer in this tank, it goes in the back corner, it's black, uh, especially if you painted the back of your tank black, you hardly see this thing. This thing just kind of like disappears, melts back in there. I've seen overflow boxes on tanks that are more obtrusive than this Comline skimmer. 
for sure an overflow box is more intrusive than yeah. this day, right? Uh, and so it was a total, total miss uh, in uh, my reefing experiences to not use these instead of a hang-on skimmer. Mm. I would use this instead of a hang-on skimmer every time now as long as the size uh, matched the function here. Mm. Uh, it was way, way, way easier. It looks way, way, way better in the tank. And you know what's kind of cool is again, you know, I find that the Germans sometimes are like a step ahead of us yeah. in many things, but they never tell us why or how. Yeah. Right? And so while we're learning and we're talking a lot more about you know managing the airflow right. in these things, mm -hmm. they had already beat us to it. And on it is like uh, on the AC one, they have a little valve that you like turn the air down, and that's how you tune the skimmer. It's yeah. not tuning water level heights and stuff for the most part. It's just tuning the amount of air to match the more organics in the mm. tank. All right, so we've been talking about that a lot recently. But we use the DC one here, which is, uh, I, I think, even better. And oh, like, yeah. You know, I don't know, 30 bucks more or something. And you can just tune the pump to adjust the amount of air. And it absolutely works the way that uh, yeah. it should, which is if you don't, uh, if you turn it up too high, it will overflow. If, uh, based on the amount of organics you have mm -hmm. in there, you can tune it down and match it, and it works really perfect. The only thing I'll note, is I will say I've had some hang-on skimmers that do mm. produce a little bit more skim aid or whatnot, but they're so huge, they're so big, they have flooding issues with mm. a lot of them, and I will just take form factor over performance <laughs> in this case, because the cost is about the same yeah, as well. True. Uh, that's up to you yourself and how you you know evaluate these things, but I would up my water change game by like, two gallons instead of five or something, you know, uh, a couple more gallons in there. Yeah. And, you know, Make have a form difference. factor that makes the tank look nice. One of the cool surprises, again, with Tunes, actually, was the light. Yeah, this, uh, the Tunes light for the Fuge, uh, being waterproof, low profile, long beam, it's just a perfect fit for that Aqua Fuge, for that hang on the back Fuge. Uh, I can put it underwater too if I wanted to, or really close to the water, not worry about, you know, am I gonna get my lights wet or anything like that. Uh, and again, I mean, it's just a perfect fit. Yeah, waterproof, what we talked about actually, you can light <laughs> it from below, you can light it yeah. above and really get at it. But I don't know, yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, the lights that come with it, kind of uh, mm -hmm. could fall in there pretty easy and like get ruined and they don't really like the tank the same way. So I really like the Tunes one. I thought it was a super perfect match for hang on skimmer or refugium like this. Yep. Also, uh, you know what worked really good in this thing? Can we clean? <laughs> it does. Well, so I've always, uh, not always, but for a, wa a long period of time, I've been skeptical of Chemi Clean. Like, yeah, maybe it works, but you know, your skimmer might overflow because it's medication in your tank, which uh, now that I've used it before, I've used it in a couple of my own tanks and watched the results and watched my cyano disappear. Uh, and now that I understand that, you know, you're, if you're dosing something to like cure cyano, there's probably gonna be, you know, some effects. And so turn your skimmer off, maybe do extra water changes when the dose is done. But uh, when you see how well it works and gets the, uh, the cyano out, then yeah, it, why not use it? It's a solution, it's a tool that uh, works for your problem. All right, so when I entered the hobby, I'm gonna call it for what I think it was, cyano shaming. <laughs> right? I mean, I think people, everybody out there is like shaming you for having cyano. Yeah. Shame on you and like, well, don't use ChemiClean or red slime remover or any of those types of things because it's just a band-aid to a problem and you have high nutrients and blah, 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 blah. No, it's back, right? Yeah. All garbage. Right? <laughs> I, I'm just going to say it like it is. And the reason I say that is maybe nutrients got you there. I don't know. But I can tell you this. I've been doing this a long time, and I've never once seen anybody solve a cyano problem by reducing nutrients in mm -hmm. their tank. Ba never once. Bacterial warfare. Mm -hmm. and, and if you get rid of the bad one and replace it with some good ones, then uh, problem solved. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. Uh, it just, we had a bunch of cyano in this, you know, typical to a new tank. Uh, and uh, we didn't have to like go add, you know, $300 for the flow and all kinds of other crazy stuff. You could buy like a $10 bottle of ChemiClean, solve the problem and yep. like not worry about it. All right, so speaking of tank shaming, the next one is, did you quarantine all your fish? <laughs> and the answer, like, uh, you see that go on in the threads mm -hmm. all the time and like people, like, you know, shame you if you didn't quarantine your fish and whatever, and yes, you should. But acknowledgement in the same mix is 95% of people do not. Yeah, right? that's true. So like, I, I don't know where that fits in. Like, if you are, raise your hand and say, man, I'm awesome. I'm like, you know, doing it better than everybody else. And be proud without shaming everybody else when a vast, vast majority aren't. So 
we're going to learn something in the next year about QT and all this stuff, and we're going to start down a journey on this one, guaranteed. Yeah. But I'm going to start it right here. Uh, and so what we did in this case is what I would call ick management. So uh, mm -hmm. I read this thread by Humble Fish, uh, who will know more about you know QT and fish disease and like uh, I could ever hold, anybody I even know combined. Uh, this <laughs> guy knows more about it. And I, I read this thread. And it was I thought it was the best. It's ick management versus ick eradication. Not two completely yeah. separate. Totally things. different things. And you can really only pick one, right? Ick eradication means I'm doing not QT but I'm doing like a QT protocol mm. that will eradicate make it from the tank by making sure it never even got in there in the first place. Right. right? Uh, not actually all that hard if you know what you're doing, mm. uh, but it is definitely a big step. Uh, or everything else, just ick management, right? Yeah, so uh, when you're talking about when people talk about like, uh, okay, so I'm a UV sterilizer and food and keeping the fish healthy, keeping the fish stress-free. Uh, you've seen ick in your tank before, but now it's kind of dwindled back and you don't really see it unless some catastrophic, or not even catastrophic, unless some stressful event happens, you might see it again. Uh, all ick management. Yeah, so I'm gonna tell you that we practice the type of ink man uh, ick management that almost every first time reefer would do in both of these tanks, which is look at it to the best of your ability, looks healthy, dump it in. <laughs> That's true. Right? Uh, and for a reason, because this is matching, like if we went into QT and stuff, like nobody would ever start this hobby. That's yeah. just uh, be insane. So uh, in this case, in the 40 breeder, how many fish do we lose? Uh, zero fish. Yeah. yeah dump so and pray work. Dump and praise, look at it and cross your fingers. Hey, that panned out. Yep. All right. How did it work in the E170? We lost a few. Um, Almost all. Yeah. And uh, repla replaced them, replenished them with new fish, but uh, there was some multiple losses. And mm -hmm. Actually, some of the replenishment dies along with yeah, it. Yeah, that's too. true. Yeah. yeah. So then we started the ick management program on this tank. Yeah. All right. So here's the deal. As I think that matches about what most people experience. If I asked uh, like on a forum or you know anywhere, uh, dump and pray worked for me. Pray, yeah, worked for me. Yeah, didn't work for me. Yeah, worked for me. Didn't work for me. That's uh, useless. Actually, actually, you know what? It is it gets you to exactly about the like you know area that you would hope to is like works for some, doesn't. It's no yeah. valuable information. Yeah, right? that helps nobody. All right. So in that thread, I found two things with a humble fish thread. If you're going to do practice ick management, there's a couple of things that a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. One of which is, you know, work on nutrition. So make sure your fish are well fed. This is like every livery organism, but you be a pet, a human being, oh, yeah. whatever. If you're, you know, have proper nutrition, you're better off to fight off different parasites and disease, right? Mm -hmm. uh, also, don't stress your fish out. Don't add so many fish that they're swimming around stressing you out and attacking each other because you're just more susceptible to disease when mm -hmm. you're stressed out. And third, don't add fish to the tank that are ick magnets, like powder blue <laughs> tangs and stuff yeah. that have super thin mucus coats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I learned something else in yeah. this thread as well. And so, you know, and I kind of knew this, but sometimes the pieces just kind of come together for you at the right time. Uh, and so, when you think about ick, you know, people ought to say like, uh, so that we're gonna like go into the next thing you talked about, which is uh, UV sterilizers, mm. right? And so UV sterilizer is not gonna eradicate ick from your tank, so you can just get that out of the way. <laughs> yeah. uh, but what it can do is reduce the amount of ick in the tank, right? And so follow along for just a second, it's because this is pretty interesting. So if you, if people say you can't like eradicate it or save your fish because it's on the fish and it's not gonna go through the UV sterilizer. Mm. Well, that's kind of true if it's like, you know, if what's on there already is going to kill it, then true. If it's on there is maybe not going to kill it, it's still kind of like doing its thing, well, maybe it can. Mm. Uh, and so this is why. The ick doesn't just like live on it and then just like explode and repopulate on, on the surface the fish. of the yeah. fish mm -hmm. and like kill it. It, you know, feeds off of the fish's, uh, you know, blood and whatnot, falls off, goes into the sand, creates a little cyst, and then replicates itself, and it could be a hundred or a thousand of them that go back into the water. Mm. Now they have about like eight hours to find a fish, you know, in that eight hours, and it's a hundred times to a thousand times as many, right? 
in that eight hours, you have a chance to be able to kill a lot of them. And oh, so yeah. uh, if you're processing almost all of the water every hour or two through uh, the UV sterilizer, you can dramatically remove or reduce the amount of those guys that are swimming around the water. Lots of them will just die because they can't find a fish, mm -hmm. right? And the other ones, we're going to reduce the uh, amount of these free swimming things. Hopefully reduce them to the rate that there will be uh, available in the ocean as well, right? They're, they, so they're exposed to these things in the ocean yeah. and still survive. Manageable right? amounts. Then. Yeah. yeah. But I thought it was really interesting because he said the, the best results was using the UV to reduce the population and then increasing the quality and the health of the, of the fish through diet, uh, stress management, and just not putting bad choices of fish in a tank that is just measured around this thing. Right. So what we did actually is add a UV sterilizer to this one. It was like one of the little hang on uh, guys from Aqua Ultraviolet. Mm -hmm. Aqua Ultraviolet producing, I, I think, you know, probably the better of the hang on models. And I was a little questionable about whether or not that was actually going to work, you know? Like, nah, let's let them do it anyway, right? <laughs> Um, no fish, no more fish death. Yeah. yeah. And not only did uh, everything stop dying, but the yellow tang in there looked like it had like days left, mm. right? I mean, it did not look good. Uh, and now it looks just fine, mm -hmm. right? And so did we reduce the amount of those free swimming form of, of ick in the tank to the point that it's still in there for sure. Oh yeah. But like now that there's not so many attacking him, is he able to fight it off? Also, there's very little stress in the tank because he's one of the only fish in there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. So I'm going to say adding the UV in this tank, actually, we threw it on there too, just because uh, mm -hmm. now we're for practicing, you know, ick management in a way that we know it. Yeah. Like we've selected a path and we're going to do that path to the best. I'm going to say this is the same thing, actually, as far as we're talking about shaming and stuff, right? <laughs> uh, there's UV shaming out there, too. There's so much debate about it. And I think a lot of it is because you don't understand how you're using it. You don't understand, like, uh, like the size of the unit, mm -hmm. how the flow rate, and all the different things. And, like, what are you even trying to achieve? And even if you do understand it, a lot of times implement it, like, improperly. A lot of people don't understand the capabilities, too, or have, like, uh, have misconceptions about what they're capable of doing and when it doesn't work out to that degree then ah, it doesn't even work yeah anecdotally i just keep seeing wins with the uv and it's one of those things we're actually going to keep explaining more because i just decided uh done with uh, uv shaming uh let's explain how this works uh and you know help people be successful with their tanks all right, so my favorite part of this whole series is actually towards the end, mm. where we talk about the inevitable challenges that most people are gonna run into, because most people are not prepared, and I, I don't know, this is my favorite part. That's, abs, I wasn't prepared when it happened to me, but, uh, and I wish there was like a, a quick guy, just tell me what I need to do to uh, treat cyano, to treat dinos, to treat coral death, to treat algae. Uh, and we, we ended up with just a five minutes, a sync guide to, hey, do this, and your, your, your chances of treating this and getting, or getting rid of it uh, exponentially better. And actually, we've implemented those uh, very same things on other tanks, even larger tanks, with uh, success, specifically the dinos. The dino one, man. Uh, if you're having problems with dino, go watch this thing for <laughs> yeah. sure, right? Uh, and actually, the, watch the cyano one first, because mm. there's a good chance you think you're fighting uh, dinos, but it's actually cyano, and this episode will help you find it out. But for me, the big part here is a lot of these things kind of just like leave you at the end of a build thread and like, all right, it's gonna be all roses from here, it's gonna be awesome. Mm. Like, no, man, there's gonna be challenges, yeah. for sure. You're yeah. gonna run into a challenge. So how you deal with it, how fast you recognize it and how you deal with it mm. uh, is absolutely one of the most valuable things that you can learn from the whole thing is, I want to know when I run into cyano what to do. And there's progressive steps of kind of like do no harm in the beginning and take, you know, progressively more advanced steps mm -hmm. as you try to solve it, especially with dinos and algae and even the coral death stuff. So like I have an actionable plan instead of, you know, Google searching, what do I do about algae? And yeah. like eight million posts and like how you'd ever get to where you wanted to go from there, I have no idea. Well, especially, I mean, we talked about this in the pH mistakes too. And one of the mistakes was not knowing what to do when there's a problem. Uh, you've Now you've got, you're armed with the information that, hey, I, I'm gonna run into this thing. May not know about it yet. 
may not have to go searching and going through, I mean, some of the threads on dinos up, uh, even now are still, you know, 30, 40, 50 some plus pages of different approaches to dinos. You don't get a real solid answer on try this and it works. So this is why, and I'm just gonna venture out here and be brave. Okay. Okay, so I read all those threads, yeah. right? And uh, here's the thing, man, scientists, like, and that's what they are. A lot of the people in those threads are super, super smart. Like, they are like biologists or mm -hmm. scientists, right? They don't like definitive statements. No, no, no. And they like to leave room, you know, for, well, it kind of works here, but here, but I don't want to like, you know, say anything super definitive. And I don't want to give a path because sometimes it's wrong, right? So that is true and helpful and accurate, but actually I'm gonna to retract the helpful. Mm. It isn't helpful. I actually want like a distinct plan on how to do this. Just give me the steps to like, in most cases, can we 80-20 this? Yeah. You know, with like 80% of you did this, you would solve it. That's what I want to know, you know? I feel bad for the 20 that did it, that didn't solve it, but the sea of information that we require me to do 40 hours of research and still I'm not really sure which path to do yeah. is way worse than that. So what we did is we compiled it all together, took all the best information, took all of the paths that people are having the most success with and compiled it into something that you can digest and easily follow. Uh, and again, we actually had the opportunity, like uh, we had dinos in the 750 and I told Josh, go watch the video and do exactly what we said in that video. Boom, dino's gone. Done. Right? Yeah. Uh, and so just super, super refreshing. Uh, you can take all that information and compile it together. Yes, there's some outliers where somebody will always uh, uh, not make it. But you know what? A lot of times when you see people fail at you know trying to get rid of stuff, mm. it's because they didn't choose to do it the way. They did it Randy's way. A little right? tweaked like, the method. Oh, yeah. I didn't really want to do all that other stuff. Yeah. So I kind of did this, and I kind of did it half-assed. Didn't work. No. <laughs> yeah. So you got to actually, you don't want to bake a cake, man. You actually have to follow the recipe, or you just, who knows what you're going to get. You know, <laughs> so it could be donuts. Uh, in this case, really got to follow this stuff, but now the information is all there, and instead of just ignoring the fact that there's going to be challenges, let's acknowledge they exist and give you the tools to beat them. All right, so my favorite part of every episode, what didn't work, this one's actually kind of a letdown. Yeah, it is a letdown in that the list is pretty short. And so, I mean, for me personally, the what didn't work, this short 40 breeder stand. I mean, you can get these 40 breeder stand and combos in all your major, you know, pet store type uh, situations. But when you know when you when you think about it, when you're looking at it in your home, and you you see us sitting down near the ground, this thing is really short. And We're sitting I, on salt buckets. Yeah, here. Uh, way 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 down. And I can't see, you know, if I'm thinking about if, if I'm standing up in my house, I'm only looking from the top down here, and I'm not enjoying the front display, the pain. Maybe if I'm sitting afar from the couch, I can, I'm enjoying the front pain, but I just want this thing to be higher, especially when you compare it to the E170 right next to it. Yeah, you know, for me, I agree. I try to find a stand that's bigger, mm. uh, or I'd put it somewhere, build my own, or do whatever I can, and it's kind of the advantages of some of these types of tanks here that come with stands and they know full well what a proper height is, yeah. uh, and it's not designed to be the cheapest thing possible. Mm. It's designed, designed to be like enjoyable in your house. Well, I mean, when you think about it, when you uh, go look at all the pictures in your house and, and where you hang them, you don't hang pictures at your belly or your knee level. You hang your pictures up right about where your eyes are so you can look at them. So, I mean, there that you go. matches, because I've always <laughs> said, essentially what a reef tank is, is just a piece of living art in your tank, yeah. in your house. Like it is, you know, a hobby for a reason. It's something you craft and create. You know, it's something visually really epic in your house. Mm -hmm. And there's no way I would spend as much as I spent on this on a piece of art and install it at knee level. <laughs> yeah, no, never I, in a no million way. million years. Uh, so what also I guess didn't work is both these tanks got cyano. So if you're raising your hand, you're like, I got cyano, and then somebody shame me. Mm -hmm. uh, you're just like one of us. You're just it's just super, super common. I mean, there's not, there's really no finger to point here on what we did during this setup that caused Cyano. Uh, I, we've set up so many tanks around this office. There's uh, tanks throughout the office that have been set up for multiple years, and still Cyano happens. Uh, the win out of it was that we found a way to cure it. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it happens. 
Another one was dipping corals here. And so a uh, challenge here, like we are dipping corals and uh, we used a dip and it didn't get rid of the babies on the zoanthids. Mm. And really what we needed to do was go and, you know, dip them like every three days for the next months. And mm. that just isn't a reality here. Yeah, know, in, so. in one of our old video, or one of our older videos, we did a, a dipping regimen. We had like two or three different types of dips and dipped a whole bunch of different corals, which worked. Uh, but here we, uh, you know, we did a quick dip in like uh, Coral RX and uh, we found, you know, the, the zoa eating nudibranchs in one and then there was some flatworms on one of the, uh, on one of the euphilia corals that we ended up dipping afterwards after we noticed them uh, and then the full recovery, but we might have uh, solved it if we dipped them properly in the first place. So one of the things I'd like to do, uh, you know, I want to build like a quarantine protocol in the future, yeah. but I also want to build like a like a dipping cor uh, protocol, right? Yeah. So there's different dips for different reasons, you know, freshwater dips for some things, there's the dip from the like uh, coral or X's or the, mm -hmm. like uh, a tea the, tree oil type or pine you know, salt, pine, yeah, yeah, and then the but, iodine type dips. There's also uh, hydrogen peroxide yeah. dips. So there was a dip episode in there that really described like what each one of those does and why you would use them. Mm -hmm. But it's not super clear which corals tolerate which one of ah, these dips. True. And I think it's on the manufacturers actually to create like a quarantine, or a, not a quarantine, a dip protocol here mm -hmm. and tell you what, you know, corals are actually safe. They're selling this product to you, they should let you know. But if they're not gonna do it, we're gonna. Right. Yeah. So I'm going to start to try to figure out over the next year, like what corals tend to tolerate each one of these, how many they tolerate uh, in a row, and then you know give you a better idea, like how do I make sure that the plug is free of algae, free of pests, you know, and just make a really clean entry into the tank or as clean as humanly possible, uh, because I want more information and I want to be you know that I'm not like taking my you know hundred dollar frag and going to kill it you know by putting it in the wrong. Tank. Oh yeah. So moving on to the hang on stuff in the tank, if I could do it over again, I'd actually do a couple things differently. Yeah, it's not uh, necessarily a didn't work because what we did, what we put onto the tank did work, but I mean, when you're looking at this 40 breeder visually in your home, there's a lot of equipment hanging off and you know, to some more of an eyesore than, than to others, uh, but there's a way around it. And so we could take the fuge off, we could take off the Eheim Liberty and then we could get, they add the uh, Comline you know, filter unit type deal. So it looks just like the Comline skimmer. So that means it goes in the corners of the tanks. It's black, you can hardly see them, they're unobtrusive. And then up your water game, our water change schedule a little bit. Yeah, so you know, one of the things that Randy and I were talking about, he's like, dude, the 40 breeder just looks better. Right? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. How to, depends on how you look at it. Yeah. So looking in the tank, if I only can see the window, I agree. But when you back away and you see the entire tank and mm. all the gear on the top, and I'm like, man, I don't know. Uh, like, I don't know if I want that in my living room. It's just so much mm. gear on it. It's just not that attractive. Like, yeah. I don't want like my stereo sitting on the you know counter with cords and stuff coming all. There's a reason why we hide it. Right. You know. Right, right. And so when I look at the E170. I like the dimensions of the 40 breeder a little better personally, but the E170 is so clean, yeah, right? Everything's in the back, hidden. All right, so the only other thing, I don't, wouldn't call it didn't work, but if I could do it from the beginning, I think I just own the fact that we are doing ick management here and put the UV on from the beginning. Yeah. I think that it's responsible for the pets, and that's one of the things we can teach up front is that it's not a goldfish, you know, that these things came halfway around the world to come live in your tank, and mm. we should take care of them, and part of that is owning which one of these paths. So I just put the uh, ick management there, do it as strong as I can. It's not super expensive, it's not super big, and just put the UV on there. It seems to have worked really well here in these cases. Yeah. So now that you have all of the information here, these two tanks are going to move now, right? Yeah. Uh, Jason is going to take one. Uh, he's going to take the E70 and the 40 breeder. Brad's getting the 40 breeder customer service. Uh, he's, I just went in his cube earlier today. He's got a spot for it. So all he has to do is set it right back up in its uh, glory and keep it trucking. So hopefully we'll be able to give you an update on how they go and they move into their new homes because they'll still be here. And if uh, you ever buy a bulk resupply, supply, you can actually come in and get a tour and you'll probably see them. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, but if you are watching this later for some reason, you want to 
see the whole series, you can actually start from the beginning. And you know, one of my biggest hopes is actually that if you know anybody that's reefing yeah. and want, is interested, like send you can them to send the them guy. the 52 weeks of reefing or a hybrid method and put them in for like 50 hours. <laughs> or you can just kind of get them the information fast and furious uh, and then two and a half hours yeah. and then we kind of move on. So if you want to do that for yourself or for anybody else, you know, you can see it right here. And uh, thanks for watching today, guys.